Okay, so I'm going to talk about optimal outlooks. And I'm not speaking for others in the Federal Reserve System, uh, especially not my uh, colleagues in the Federal Open Markets Committee. And I, you know, I thank uh, these folks in particular, but in, you know, in general, my talks are just a, a, a team effort, a product that a lot of people have been getting to spend help working together with me to produce events, especially true of this one. Okay, so you know, I'm often, when I'm, when I go out and give talks as a, a policymaker, people are often interested in my outlook. What's the future going to look like? Like, why do I care about what the outlook is? Why do I care about the future as a policymaker? And the answer is, is because I, it's because it matters for a decision I'm going to make today. A policymaker needs to make a decision today, but that decision doesn't have an immediate impact. It has an impact in the future. There's some lag. And moreover, that impact depends on other influences. So the impact ends up being random because I don't know what those other shocks, those other influences are, are going to be that that uh, uh, will impact the economy or, or society. So my decision today depends on what I think is going to be happening in the future in terms of these, uh, in terms of the, the losses I'll be describing that, that the, the, the occur to society as a result of my my taking action. I'm always going to be talking this talk about net losses from decisions. Um, you can think about net benefits as well, loss that will be positive or negative. So it's, it's I guess it's a somewhat pessimistic view of thinking about policy making, but, um, but, but, uh, but, but, but you, can, you, can, you can think about either benefits or losses. The point is, I make a decision today, why well, I want to have an outlook is because it's going to matter, have an impact in the future. And the question I'm going to ask today is, what's the appropriate notion of an outlook for this policy maker? What, how should they go be going about formulating the outlook for the future? Now the answer to, 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 to give away the punchline right up front is that usually, or often when we think about doing this, we try to use a statistically motivated predictive density. We build a statistical forecasting model that'll tell us something about the future. I'm gonna argue that that approach is dominated by a different, different one, which is to use a risk-neutral probability density, to instead use the information in asset prices about uh, that, that lead us into uh, to construct what's called, and it's familiar to most of them, most of them, probably all of you in the room, as uh, referred to as a risk neutral probability density. Now, why do you want to do that? Why is it you want to look to asset prices to formulate your outlook as opposed to building a statistical model? Well, the intuition is that if you're using a statistical forecast, it's as if you're acting that resources on the margin are equally valuable in every state of the world. The only, the only difference across states of the world in the future is they differ in the likelihood of occurrence. But resources might be different in value across states of the world for other reasons besides their likelihood of occurrence. And awful decisions should be reflected those relative resource valuations. It shouldn't be based only on the likelihood of occurrence of the future states of the world, and instead, should take into account the, how valuable resources are in those states. If you formulate your asset, your, your outlook based on financial market prices, that is, uh, that, that's going to do that, and that's what a risk neutral probability density function is going to be doing. You're basically building an outlook derived from financial market prices, and it will then automatically reflect the relative values of resources in different states of the world. Whereas an outlook based on statistical forecast is not going to do that. So that's the intuition for my talk. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk through a, a general policy problem. I'll show how the general policy problem leads us to use risk neutral probabilities. And I'll go through an example, um, an example motivated by a, mac, a, mac, a question that comes up from macro predictive supervision, a, a question actually that the Federal Reserve does face. And then I'll, I'll wrap up some conclusions. Okay, so the choice problem I have in mind, you have a policymaker, P, who chooses an action, A, and that action is going to result in the future in some losses. Okay, so the action that you choose today is going to uh, result in some losses. Those losses are a function not just of your action, but also some other 
uh, factors, some other shocks that are hitting the economy, but I'm just going to summarize in this little random variable x. And just to make things easier, I'm going to assume x has got a finite number of realizations. And the loss will be positive or negative. Okay. So that's, that's you take an action today, results in possible set of losses that can take place uh, depending on what happens with x. The way to think about that, the way I'm going to urge you to think about that is that when I take the action today, it results in a vector of possible losses that could occur next year. And now this is very familiar ground to, 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 to people here. I'm sure that when you think about these dollars that you're accruing, these, these, these losses are denominated in dollars, and the dollars loss in one state Rating is not maybe not be the same in terms of marginal valuation as the dollar in other states. These are really different goods. So each choice of an action really is resulting in a different bundle of goods. The different bundle of goods are really the dollars in different states of the world that the, the action is, is generated for you. And the question is how should the policymaker compare these bundles to one another? Okay, so just to, to, so to, 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 try to try to answer that question, what I'm going to do is step aside from that policy problem for a moment and instead think through an even simpler question of uh, what I call a simple food analogy. So now we're going to step away from that and just think about a, a very simple question, which is I'm asked, Diana, you have a choice. I'm going to come and take A apples and B bananas from you or A prime apples and B prime bananas from you. So which choice will I take? To do this, I need some way to combine apples and bananas together. Right? I have to have some way to put these two different goods together into one to form a number, and then I can compare those numbers to one another. Now, should I just add up the number of his apples and bananas together? This is a little tweak in my macro French. Should I go out and estimate a representative agent model of CDS preferences over uh, apples and bananas? Now, I don't think either of those strike us as the most immediately uh, intuitive way to proceed on this. And so the, the right approach is to ask, how much will it cost me to go out and replace the lost fruit? So how much will it cost me to go out and buy the fruit that I, I need to, to, to replace it? Well, that immediately leads you to compare the value, the market value, what's being taken from you. The key point I want to make here is the comparison that you're going to make when you compare these two baskets of fruit that are being taken from you requires the use of appropriate market prices. You need to price the apples, the price the bananas, and then you're just going to compare these two values to one another. Okay, so that was the fruit analogy, and what I hope to convince you of there is if you're asked to compare the loss of two baskets of fruit, the way you would be doing that is by using market prices. Well, I'm going to argue by analogy here that the policymaker should be using the same kind of approach to be thinking about the baskets of losses associated with taking different actions. So if you choose, and this is, I think, the most complicated slide I have in a lot of ways. So the policymaker chooses an action A. We just uh, this is uh, this is the assumption of the problem. Society suffers a random loss. It's a basket of losses, a bundle of losses indexed by the things that could happen to, in the economy. These X's that could hit the economy or in the future. How can you replace those losses for society? Well, you can replace them by going out and buying a portfolio that has the same payoff, right? So this. This is a random payoff, random losses, indexed by X's. To, to do this thing we did in the fruit example, where we went out and bought a basket of fruit to replace it, well, what we're going to do here is go on financial markets and buy a portfolio that has the same um, random payoff vector as what we're incurring by taking the action in. Then we can think about the value of that portfolio we're using to, buy, to replace the value of that portfolio is replacing the losses incurred as hitting society when I take action A as being the cost of taking the action A, the current cost of that action. And then 
choosing, how should the policymaker choose A so as to minimize that cost? And again, the main point, takeaway is that this, these two bullets at the very end of the bottom is say, I needed to use appropriate market prices here, and then I need to use appropriate market prices here as well. And that's what's going to lead us to risk neutral probabilities. Because that's what risk neutral probabilities are. They're just going to be the appropriate prices. So, so what I'm going to do first, so uh, it's not clear why I, I, I can say why I do this, but I'll do it anyway. So I, I'm going to walk through first to talk through state prices. So a policymaker is going to choose A, and society is going to lose this many dollars when X occurs, when X N occurs. So, the, so what is that saying? That's saying that this is really like the apples. <laughs> this is how many dollars you lose when X takes on a particular value X N. Let's focus on how much it would cost to reimburse society for that particular loss, that loss in that one state of the world. Well, to answer that question, you need a price. And the right price to be thinking about is the current price of the dollar that you're going to be receiving in the future when the state of the world is X N. And that is, I'm just going to call it QN. Now, by look, going across the axis, all the possible states of the world that are out there, we can formulate our our cues. We have a we'll have a we'll have a. It's just like the the price of every fruit. We'll have a price for every state of the world as well. That's the, the vector state price. Okay, so now once we have these, these prices, now we can we have a way to, to to add up to associate every action with a number, namely the value of the resource being lost, the current cost of taking the action, and I just. Multiply the losses by the price, add them, add them up. And now the problem for the policymaker is clear. They just want to minimize this, the value of what's being lost. So risk control probabilities, oh, we don't want to affect decisions. We define QN by a constant. So I'm going to divide it by a constant. I'm going to divide it by the sum of the QNs. I mean, economically, of course, what I'm doing right now is instead of doing things in terms of Dollars in terms of uh, uh, dollars today, I'm essentially converting into a, a risk-free bond tomorrow. But it, 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 I'm, just, I'm going to do it more mechanically. I'm just going to divide by the sum here. At this point, we have what's called the risk neutral probability density of X. And uh, you know, different people have one of the great thing, uh, the things you can get into fights about in, in academia is, uh, or, or, or recall with great fondness is, is language. And, uh, and uh, people, you know, this term is not one that everyone likes. And there's a reason why you shouldn't like it. Because it, the term probability makes people think you're telling them something about how likely events are to take place in the future. It sounds like that. It's really not like that. It's not what it is. It's a, a sum of a bunch of numbers that sum to one that are non-negative. <laughs> that's and that that ha that's a probability. That's right. That's you know formally what it is. And that's great because there's a bunch of theorems we can use then to to manipulate these objects, and that's great news. But in your mind, when you use probability, you're often thinking it's saying something about how likely these events are. It's not. It's just telling you about the relative valuations of the relative prices. And this is the this slide here. Um, the Q star, the risk neutral probability density, is not the same as the true probability density. I put true in quotes because I don't really know if I can tell you what the true probability density even is. But for those of you who think you know what that means, it's not the same as that one. <laughs> <laughs> so and it's going to reflect a bunch of other things, and uh, these are really a, a subset of things that can be affecting Q star. It affects the asset figures of urgent risk, reflect their uh, various assessments, their own assessments of the likelihood of X, the various realizations X. It could just be a like dollars in one state versus another. I left that off the slide, but that's possible. They might just have preferences such that's true. Okay, but one, the, the cool thing is once you have a Probability density, as I said, there's a bunch of theorems out there that you can use. Anything you learn about expectations, now you can apply 
by the distinct but the familiar operator, for those of you who took, you know, took, you took an asset pricing, you've got this thing called E star. And E star is just the expectation of any random variable associated with using the Q stars as probabilities. The weighted average of all the possible realizations of that random variable using the risk neutral probability densities as the way to weight. So then the problem for a policymaker is to minimize the expectation, the risk neutral expectation of the loss. And if you add differentiability, which I'm going to assume you do, that's just going to say you want to set your expected marginal loss equal to zero of taking an action. On the margin, you want the expected loss to be zero. So this is, you know, at least when I took first year micro, I think first year micro got much more sophisticated when I took it, but when I took first year micro, you would see this in the first week or so. This is this was with it basically, with <laughs> setting marginal cost equal to zero on average. Um, I guess the on average part would be like the 70. But but now, so then this is, but the difference here is the appropriate notion of the outlook is being given by E star. You're using the the start expectation, risk neutral probability densities, and not um, some statistical forecast. And the reason for that is we talked about at the very beginning in the, 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 in the introduction of the talk, the policymaker is trying to balance the losses across states of the world. And the, that balancing should take into account the relative valuations of resources in those states of the world. And then what relative valuations are being captured by state prices, that is being captured by risk neutral, the risk neutral probability I'm going to skip my endogeneity uh, slides. I, anyway, so they're available. All, all these slides will be on the internet. For those of you who can't see them at all, they're going to be on the, they'll be on the internet um, uh, at the Minneapolis Fed. So let me talk about macro credential supervision. So that's going to be my example of how you, how you would go about trying to use this. And it, it's a revealing example in the sense that I think it's revealing in, in, in two ways. It's revealing about how you could go out and do this, and then it's also revealing about some of the challenges that come up when you do that. So the law, there's a regulatory question. Large banks want to pay dividends. Now the question is, how large a dividend payment should they be allowed to make? Now, why, why, you know, uh, the regulator is facing a financial stability trade off. In the sense that a low dividend payment today means the bank is going to have more capital in the future. They'll have more of a buffer to be able to withstand shocks. So if you're worried about financial market stresses in the future, you might want that bank to have more capital to, to guard against that. And that's going to make you want to think you'd want to, you want to pay a lower dividend today. So S is the level of financial market stress in this period. I'm going to use that notation. And then there's some net social loss next period of current dividend payment. And I'll just call that L. And A is this dividend payments being made now. And S is what X used to be, essentially. It's just the financial market stresses. Well, we know now from the, uh, the, the, the analysis we did already that we want to set the optimal dividend to, so that the expectation of the net law, marginal net loss is equal to zero. And then expectation is the risk neutral expectation, the E stars. Okay. So, what this means is so, how do we use this? Well, the approved level of current bank dividends should depend on our outlook for, for future financial market strains. So, how, how would this work? So, think about two possibilities the risk neutral probability density for S is given by Q star, and the other is given by something else, Q star star. And the difference between these two things is the first risk neutral probability density puts more weight on financial markets being more strained. So technically, Q star is going to be uh, first order dominate, Q star star. But basically, I'm just saying under Q star, financial markets, it's more likely financial markets can be strained. Now, more likely, I've already slipped in a bit. I hate this. Uh, using them as of probabilities, but it's really, I'm talking about under the risk neutral probability. So it's really the margin valuation, it could just be the margin value, it's just about the margin valuation of the, of the loss, of the resources in those states of the world. So this is, uh, 
is a term that I, we would not have used in the case of micro, but now, now that it's always used, it's uh, the term, the idea that the loss function is supermodular. So all that's going to mean is that um, when financial markets are strained, increasing dividends is going to be worse for society. So if, if financial markets aren't going to be strained next period, it's going to be relatively little loss of letting the banks pay out, have, pay out a dividend today, whereas, regardless of how big that is, but if they're going to be strained next period, it's going to be a big deal. That's what supermodularity is going to happen. Then in this case, the, re the regulator should approve a lower level of bank dividends when the risk of probability density is putting more weight on high realization. So if you're in Q star as opposed to Q star star, you want to pay out lower dividends. So that's just, you know, uh, you just need those two assumptions, first order dominance, and modularity, and it'll just fall out of the, the first order condition. But it's also intuitive. I mean, that's, uh, that's the, the... Now, the key question then is, okay, that's very nice, but then we're gonna have to find out what is the risk neutral probability density for financial market strains? And that's where, you know, we'll start using some judgment and, and some, uh, and that's, it, it, we're, it, but this is, this is how policy making works. Is that it doesn't just fall off the shelf with the right answer. That's going to be. You need an appropriate proxy for these financial market stresses. Now, appropriate proxy, what does that mean? You want it to be highly correlated with financial market stresses, and you want a lot of options on it. Why do you want a, a lot of options on it? Because that's what you're going to use to measure the risk of public density, is having the, those options in their prices. So a lot of options, I mean, you know, options distinguished by their strike. So one possibility is, you know, so what you want to do, of course, you want to use a bunch of different things, but one possibility is use the negative of the log S&P 500 index as S prime, that is, as your proxy for financial market stress. So when the S&P index is low, financial markets are more likely to strain than when it's high. You can certainly estimate an RNPD for, for the risk for, for the S&P 500 index. What this is arguing is when that has a longer left tail, that risk for probability density has a longer left tail, you want to let banks pay off a smaller dividend. Because it's going to be more likely that you're going to be faced with financial market stresses. Okay, so let me wrap up. So risk neutral probability densities are an ex ante measure, this is just definitional, an ex ante measure of the relative values of resources in future states of the world. Resources are all, of course, they're going to be all else equal, resources are, are more valuable, but states are more likely to occur. But the point is all else is never equal. And that's why a risk neutral probability density is always going to be shaped by factors other than the relative likelihood of the state occurring. So you don't want to be using an RNPD, a risk neutral probability density, that you're getting off the market prices for predicting things. Because it's being shaped by a bunch of other stuff. But it's this distinction between a risk neutral probability density and predictive densities that exactly makes them useful for policymakers. Because a policymaker has to weigh off benefits and costs in future states of the world in terms of loss of resources. And that should be based on the relative values of resources in those states of the world, not the relative likelihoods. So for a policymaker, the relevant outlook is being given by our risk neutral probability, <coughs> not by a predictive density. Now, this is not life is not easy. Using RPDs is not necessarily made easy. You're gonna have to determine the appropriate financial market proxy for the uh, variable of interest for you. Uh, for example, uh, as a policy policymaker, I might be interested in unemployment. Forming an outlook for that, we're going to have to have a good financial market proxy for that. It's not necessarily going to be trivial to, to come up with that. And even then, the available options, um, you might, uh, especially, uh, it might not, might not be cover long enough horizons. You might want to look four or five years out. You might not have good options, good uh, option fading, uh, which sufficient mar uh, thickness of markets uh, that far out. Or you might be worried about extreme tail events. Again, that might not be covered by the available options. This is not an indictment of risk neutral probability densities because this is true of anything you do as a policymaker. Really, frankly, you do anything in life as a decision maker. You have to use good judgment, good data, good modeling choices. You have to use them all in conjunction. The point is, when you're thinking about what you want, 
We want to be modeling and estimating a risk neutral probability density and not a statistical forecast. So, we're not just talking the ninth district. We're actually going on doing something about this. And what we're doing is um, our banking group um, has on their website, they use options data to compute risk neutral probability densities for a wide range of assets. Um, they include gold and silver, wheat, because that's you know, the interest of people here in the district. Um, S&P 500 exchange rates, oil, because that's also a great interest of people. That are, uh, we have a huge oil boom going on in northwestern North Dakota. That's uh, so we've got oil as well. And we report and archive the results on a week by weekly basis. Uh, so you can check it out here. And you know, I have to say, there's been some interesting de uh, developments in the last six weeks or so. Maybe a little longer than that, go out to, to mid March in uh, what's happening, the risk neutral probability density of the S&P 500, for example. So, but, but in any event, so I encourage you to go and look at that and you'll see how those are, are changing over time. That's it, thanks a lot. I'm certainly happy to take any questions.